Yeah, thanks. Hello, everybody. Um, um, so in this presentation, I would like to uh, share with you some observations about why <coughs> formalization of small-scale forestry sector in Indonesia has been a difficult process, and it's kind of a continues to be an elusive, elusive journey, elusive process. And uh, I would like to do that basically by combining some research material that I have collected on the on the history of, of logging or forestry sector in Indonesia some time ago, with much more recent material on sort of legality verification, legality timber legality uh, uh, verification in Indonesia, which we have been doing uh, at C4 over the last two years. Um, Putting it all together, I think, would enable us or enable me to kind of say something about some of the obstacles or barriers to formalizing, um, formalizing small-scale sector, forestry sector in Indonesia. And I would like to do this um, um, kind of by, by placing this discussion in historical perspective, because I believe that by looking at uh, the, the history of the small-scale sector and how it kind of uh, evolved over time and went through different phases of or attempts of formalization. I think we can learn a lot about what's happening today, where is it now. I think it enables us to understand the current situation much better. And it also kind of enables me at least to better understand what may be the sort of a possible steps that could be could be taken to overcome the barriers, to overcome the problems, and under what circumstances that's that's possible. So I will do this chronologically. I, 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 will, I don't want to kind of bore you to death, but uh, I would like to kind of go step by step through pre-colonial, colonial, colonial post-independence, and sort of the, the democratization period, and then sort of the current situation with the small-scale forestry sector, and then maybe draw some conclusions at the end. So uh, this is going to be a bit of a history lesson, but I hope you bear with me. Um, and most of, the, most of this discussion will be kind of heavily based on what, what I found and what I, with the research that I've done in Kalimantan, on, in, in Indonesian part of Borneo, uh, specifically East Kalimantan province. It's, a, it's, a, it's been the center of Indonesian forestry for decades, for, for, for even, we could say, centuries. Um, there continue to be a lot of forest in that area. It continues to be important uh, economically. And, uh, and that's why you know, I, I, I'll focus there. But at the same time, later on in my talk, I will kind of try to pull back <coughs> and connect this discussion to the national level, to, to Indonesia more broadly. So about the pre-colonial period, it's, uh, what about small-scale logging in that, in, in that time period? Um, in those days, basically in the 17th, 18th, 19th century, the all natural resources, including timber, as already was mentioned before uh, in the presentation of, uh, by, you know, Nancy Peluso, all of that was domain of local sultanates, and uh, essentially they handed out rights to traders um, to exploit these resources uh, in exchange for tribute payments, so the 10 percent tax, essentially. And in those days, the, the focus of this extraction was on NTFPs and gold. Timber was there as well, but very specific timber, iron wood for trade uh, uh, to other parts of the archipelago. And essentially this extraction was done through buy-up schemes, whereby these traders would engage in relationships with local communities to extract resources uh, and buy them up and take them out of the forest. Um, as, as we kind of move forward to the, to the earlier decades or early, year, uh, early years of the 20th century, um, sort of the, 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 the forest resources for these local uh, power holders, uh, sultans, become more and more important because what some of the major resources such as coal, rubber, uh, you know, oil and so on, that's, that's being increasingly taken over by the Dutch administration. And so as a result, there's greater emphasis on these small-scale extraction uh, operations uh, in exchange for these tribute payments. That eventually also catches the attention of the Dutch, and they say, in 1924, they say basically, well, it's actually, uh, is it small scale or is it you know, becoming large scale? So uh, they came up with this uh, regulation where, whereby uh, they wanted to kind of 
declared of the entire forest area the, uh, the domain of the state and explicitly they wanted to make sure that logging is being done through commercial concessions. However, at that time they did, this proposal didn't go through because uh, there was some debates going on between the, the academia, the, the people who, who were kind of uh, this, uh, the, the debate about uh, land rights and uh, indigenous land rights, not indigenous land rights, it, it was about community land rights, the, the systems, uh, uh, and whether or not these should be somehow reflected in the, in the, in the formal, formal system of uh, land planning and control. So this was, the, the, the debate went for a few years, but in 1934, Eventually, it was decided that yes, uh, there will be formalization, and all logging from now on takes place through concessions. Um, and there was a very clear kind of explanation at that time that you know the reason why we are going to do that is because there's a lot of inefficiency in small scale, there's a lot of waste, there's a lot of tax evasion, there's a lot of smuggling, and you know concessions will basically generate a lot of new additional tax revenue. Plus, of course, there was this kind of ethical reason to protect the, uh, the, the local communities, uh, the indigenous people, from exploitation. So, as a result, what happened was that uh, the concessions did multiply. There was actually growth in concessions. But it didn't mean that small-scale logging has disappeared because, in fact, most of these commercial concessions operated based on small-scale um, logging. They employed these small-scale loggers to extract timber and uh, uh, for, for basically for, for cost-cutting reasons. And small-scale logging continued essentially because you know the, they 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 paid these traditional tribute payments to sultans, which in turn kind of turned a blind, blind eye on these activities and avoided paying official taxes if they were to pay you know both the sort of traditional tribute plus the uh, official tax. That would be an excessive, uh, excessive uh, tax burden, and that was the reason why they essentially refused to formalize. In the early independence period, in late 1940s, 50s, 60s, uh, so this sort of official policy of, of, of uh, formalization of uh, uh, on, uh, conducting logging through commercial permits uh, continued. And the only change basically was that uh, until 1958, people in charge of this policy were sultans. After 58, these uh, people in charge became um, government officials, forestry officials at the provincial and district level. The real change started in 1965 with the political changes in Indonesia from sort of semi-socialist system to, to market-based capitalist-oriented system. And then in 1967, there was the introduction of basic forestry law and some investment laws, which actually stimulated investment in forestry uh, on large scale. The interesting thing at that time was that there was a regulation as well in place for small scale logging, which was very simple and which also imposed fees or so let's say taxes on small scale logging which were very lenient, we, and they were based on the logging area and not per cubic meter extracted. So it was actually quite lenient and quite easy to follow. As a result, you know, uh, just showing some figures, the, it, the, the number or the size, the cumulative size of small-scale logging concessions actually increased dramatically, uh, doubled in fact, from 67 to 69 over a two-year period. And timber production also grow, grew several times in the late 60s and early 70s. But again, as, uh, as this market develops, as Japan, Japan at that time particularly was the main destination for timber, as demand is growing, um, um, there is this new initiative to consolidate and to, uh, to, uh, to maximize on this new resource. So there's this new reg regulation coming in in 1971 that uh, uh, essentially saying that you know, from now on, logging has to be done through larger concessions, more capital intensive, it has to be me mechanized. So again, small scale logging is becoming marginalized. And very similar reasons, again, you know, efficiency, uh, tax evasion, and you know, desire to collect, to generate more tax revenues, all of that comes into play again. 
So millions of hectares are being allocated for large-scale concessions. Uh, I think by 1979, Indonesia was the largest uh, tropical roundwood producer in the world. And, and until 1990 or so, I think something on the order of 50 million hectares was handed out to large-scale logging concessions. At the same time, there's basically no room for small-scale logging. And, um, but it doesn't mean that it disappears because um, the same system continues. In exchange for this protection money, uh, they operate at the, you know, fulfilling local demand as well as for inter-island trade. And it's a kind of a conscious decision to avoid this double taxation and operate informally at the local level. Okay, I will have to speed up a little bit because I'm being <laughs> prompted. Um, from in 1999, we have this, this, this decentralization happening in Indonesia. And again, there is a new kind of scheme to allow, to allow small-scale logging to recur. Um, but again, because these small-scale operations are very much kind of front for large, larger companies, there's a fair amount of abuse, smuggling, and so on. There's a kind of pullback in 2002 and 2003, and, uh, and, uh, and the small-scale logging operations sort of disappear again. They recur again in 2009 with a sort of new acronyms and new schemes. Uh, but there's a st strict, much stricter regality uh, s uh, requirement uh, at, at this time. Essentially, at this time, Indonesia is in the process of negotiating voluntary partnership agreement with EU, and there's this timber legality uh, verification system, SVLK, which, which is being implemented, and all timber operations in Indonesia, including small-scale sector, have to be fully compliant. This involves costs. So that presents some problems for small-scale operations. So what is the small-scale sector in Indonesia today in the face of these demands for verification? I'm just presenting here some, some numbers. Basically, we're dealing with thousands of units of these small-scale industries as well as logging operations. In Java, we've got maybe 100 and Java and Bali, 140,000 units. According to the National Statistics Bureau, there may be up to 680,000 units of these small-scale businesses throughout the country. So we are talking about large numbers. Um, all of them are supposed to be legally verified by January next year, in theory. And what has been done so far? So far, as, as far as we know, there's about 62 units of those small-scale industries that have been certified. And again, you know, from what we know, there is, there's, there's great reluctance, actually, to get into this formalization and legality verification because of cost concerns of double taxation. You know, yes, they become formal, they pay taxes to the state, but they still are subject to informal taxation as well and protection money. So there is a problem here. So to conclude, you know, looking historically how, how this developed up and down, I think we see some kind of regularity of kind of uh, attempts to formalize, but then pull back, attempts to formalize and pull back. And this pullback is largely to the concerns of costs, I think, and double taxation, um, which pushes them, these small-scale operations, to kind of go back to the informality. Um, and again, there's a question of this protection money that this kind of uh, entrenched uh, practices of uh, corruption and, and also complicated bureaucratic procedures to obtain permits and to sustain businesses. So I'm just thinking, well, it's kind of a, some of the steps that could be considered to how potentially formalization could be made easier. Uh, but, I, I, you know, it's not going to be easy. But essentially, you know, simplicity in regulatory mechanisms. Uh, there, are, there are many policies in Indonesia which are supposed to, which are supposed to encourage small-scale sector to grow. But they are not easy. They are centralized, and they are not easy to follow. So the simplicity is needed. Cheap credit for small-scale operations, or small-scale sector is also needed to stabilize their operations and actually to be able to kind of mainstream their activities. And then, of course, the big question is about eliminating this protection money and this corruption, which is kind of a never-ending topic. And uh, I think uh, it's a major question, and it's uh, a lot hinges on it. I think I'll stop here. Yeah. Thank you.